folks, my name is Mo Amir and this is Van Color, British Columbia's bona fide culture and politics TV talk show right here on Check and Check Plus. We're also on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Tonight, it's our season finale before we take a short break for the summer. But as you can tell, I'm already in vacation mode. We kicked off our inaugural season with the Premier of British Columbia, John Horgan, and we're gonna end our inaugural season with the man who, by the end of this year, looks poised to replace him as BC's next Premier. It's because of all of you and your confidence in me that I will be putting my name forward. And I want your consideration as the next leader for the BC NDP. First elected as the BC NDP MLA for Vancouver Point Grey in 2013 by defeating then Premier Christy Clark, you know him as the outgoing Attorney General of British Columbia and the BC Minister responsible for housing. Back in December 2019, he told British Columbians that I would be a famous talk show host when I was only a year into this whole podcasting thing. And here we are on primetime television, BC's own yoga dad. He is Dave. David E.B. David. So Hi, nice to see you. It's good to be here. I, uh, I'm ready to go. We timed this perfectly. Yeah, I just was wearing my Hawaiian shirt today. It was a bonus. <laughs> I love it. I, so I got a question for you. Yeah. You have about 85% of caucus endorsing you. The rumored candidates for the BC NDP leadership race and then the winner becoming the Premier of British Columbia. Uh, those candidates are not running. And, and they have basically said that we're not running. We either support you or they're neutral. Can I just call you the Premier of BC? No. No? <laughs> no, you can't. There's a whole leadership race happening. Uh, we're this is a, a race of one. Yeah, well, for now. Uh, we're, a, we're a Democratic Party, and uh, the, anyone who wants to run for leader up till October 6th uh, October 4th, uh, can put their name forward. It's still time for me. There's time for you, Mo. Absolutely. Yeah. You're welcome in the race. I'm just It'll sizing be you up right now. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, you've got great fashion sense. Oh, so thanks. that'll start you I well. That. Yeah. So I got a question. Whoever becomes leader, what is their obligation to carry out the promises of the previous premier, John Horgan? And in other words, for the renters in British Columbia, should they stop holding their breath for that rebate? Yeah, yeah, really good question. I think that uh, the focus for me and the reason why my colleagues have supported me in the, in the numbers they have is we're all just completely committed to delivering for British Columbians on the priorities that British Columbians have. And it's rising costs around housing is one of those key issues, and especially for renters. Mm -hmm. So delivering on the renters rebate that we committed to in the election and other election commitments is really important. And so is responding to the evolving situation with inflation and costs for British Columbians and the continually uh, challenging housing file. If you were to become leader, do you feel like you would have to establish your mandate with British Columbians? Like, would you be calling an early election or will the BCNDP uh, see out their whole term in full? Uh, well, if, if I'm successful in being leader, uh, we'll be focused on delivering for British Columbians. And, and that means doing the work in the legislature, not calling an election. Uh, what if and, you're like really high in the polls? Yeah, it, I mean, <laughs> I just I just look around and I'm talking to British Columbians and I'm talking to my friends and I'm and, and just nobody uh, is looking for this uh, in terms of the politics. And that's one of the reasons why the leadership race, I think, is shaping up the way it is, is my colleagues, too. They just want to be focused on the work. John stepping down was a, a big surprise for us. Uh, and it was important for him and his family, uh, but he wasn't stepping down because he wasn't popular or mm -hmm. people didn't like the direction the government was going. Uh, and so in that kind of situation, I think we all just want to get together and stay unified and deliver on what we committed to do. So is that almost a promise that you will see out the full term as elected? Yeah, that's I mean, that's my commitment. And uh, I mean, barring a, a, an uprising and interest in British Columbians for an election, uh, that's the direction. And and the reason for that is pretty straightforward. I mean, the, the challenges we face are now and we need to deal with them and and we don't need to be focused on politics. So let's talk about some of those challenges. When we look at B.C., Metro Vancouver has some of the highest or perhaps the highest housing prices in North America. We have the highest gas prices in North America. We have a real shortage of, or, of doctors or just perhaps a lack of access to family doctors across this province. So if you were to become the new leader, how do you convince British Columbians that the BCNDP are working hard and delivering for families across the province? 
Well, British, British Columbians can see what we're doing, and they also are smart. They know what's happening in the world. They know where uh, these challenges are coming from, issues like the war in Ukraine, uh, coming out of the pandemic, some of the challenges we've had in, in, in the healthcare system. Uh, COVID still incredibly present with a lot of people away from work because they're COVID positive and they can't go into the hospital to work. It's impacting our healthcare system. And so uh, they want to see us working on these issues, and we have to deliver on that. So it's things like opening the hospitals that we've committed to across the province. There's a number of different sites. St. Paul's under construction right right now, uh, as well as recruiting uh, those family doctors uh, internationally and nationally and making sure we're keeping the family doctors we have, supporting them and doing the work that we need them to do. Um, I have total confidence in the Premier and my colleagues in the legislature during this leadership race to keep addressing those issues. And uh, and hopefully uh, at the end of the, the leadership race, a, a smooth transition to the new leader, and I hope it's me, uh, so that we can keep doing that work and delivering on those issues. So the official opposition, the BC Liberals also have have a new leader, Kevin Falcon. And, you know, they've been a lot more aggressive in being the official opposition. Mm -hmm. Have the BC NDP officially retired the phrase, you had 16 years? Have we gone past the point of expiration on that clapback? Well, I think, you know, when I uh, reflect on what British Columbians are interested in right now, uh, they're really not interested in a partisan back and forth between mm -hmm. the BC Liberals and the NDP. What they want is action on the issues of the day. And, um, you know, Mr. Falcon has a record and and uh, we'll talk about that when the election comes, of course. Um, and he's focused on changing the name of his party, and that's fine. But, you know, for us, we're in government, we have to deliver, and that's what we'll be judged on. When British Columbians at, uh, at the fixed election date are making their decision, it'll be about... Um, did the NDP deliver for us? Uh, and uh, and are we seeing in our community the kinds of directions uh, that we want to see? Awesome. Well, hey, David, we have to pay the bills here, so we're going to take a quick break. Okay, but I have many good. more questions for okay, you. Okay, great. Thanks, Mom. Folks, stick around, because after some business, we're going to discuss housing with our guest tonight, the presumed next premier of British Columbia, David Eby. Of course, I'm Mo Amir, and this is Van Culler. Welcome back to This is Van Keller. My name is Mo Amir, and we've been chatting with our featured guest tonight. He is, as of recording, the only candidate running to lead the BC NDP and become the new Premier of BC by the end of this year. He is David Eby. David, thanks for sticking around. You bet, Mo. So I'm looking at the political landscape here in Canada, and you... Pierre Polyev, who is the presumptive leader of the Conservative Party, possibly, and the leader of the official opposition, the leader of the BC Liberals, Kevin Falcon, seem to be on the same page about senior levels of government intervening in local government processes, particularly around housing development, and saying that you guys aren't building enough, we might have to step in, we might have to rezone, perhaps. You guys all seem to be on the same page with this idea. Is that a fair assessment that you're all in agreement? Uh, well, the the math is pretty remarkable for British Columbia when it comes to housing. We had the biggest uh, population increase in 60 years last year. Wow. And in the first quarter of this year, we broke uh, the record for last year. So we're already on a record petting, setting pace for this year. Uh, and all those folks coming in, uh, they need a place to live. And we already had housing challenges even before that kind of population growth. So we're seeing it across the province. And uh, it's only ramped up during the pandemic. So... Uh, you know, I think that when we uh, look at those numbers, anyone who's looking at those numbers um, can come to the conclusion, we got to build more housing. And the municipalities, it has been very frustrating as Minister for Housing to write to mayors to say, please approve this housing. We need this rental housing. We're mm -hmm. desperate for the uh, for this housing to be built, uh, even for BC housing projects where it's funded by government uh, to say, please approve these quickly. <laughs> like, it's so frustrating. It's just so desperate. And uh, and some cities get it, some mayors get it, and some don't. And, and uh, we need... What is that? intervention look like from senior levels of government, aside from telling them, please build more housing? Well, uh, because it comes down to math, just the number of people coming in and the number of young people leaving their parents home and starting their own places, their own households, their own families, uh, uh, we can set targets. And we have done housing needs studies for uh, cities across the province. So we know the numbers of units that they have to deliver. Mm -hmm. And uh, using targets with them is one way that we could reward those cities that are building the housing we need. And we can hold accountable the cities that aren't building the housing that we need. 
And uh, and so even basic things or secondary suites, which are like basement suites uh, or suites inside a house are illegal mm-hmm. in many parts of the province still. We need to legalize rental housing. Sure. I mean, it's uh, if you want to build more than one unit on your lot, you need to be allowed to do that. And uh, and you shouldn't have to go to a public hearing for it. Uh, so there are all of these things that are really frustrating and, and they're frustrating for some of the mayors, too. So we can change the rules around that so that they can approve the housing faster uh, for those mayors that uh, and the city councils that don't want to do it uh, for various reasons. I think we can encourage them to take on more growth by supporting them with the, the things that uh, make life livable in, in denser cities. And like, I guess that, that's what I'm getting at. When you when you talk about keeping these municipalities accountable, like what do you mean? Do you mean actually going in and rezoning areas of BC? Uh, you know, um, there uh, those authorities already exist. The Minister for Municipal Affairs can overturn land use decisions that okay. are made by municipalities. I don't think that power has ever been exercised. But we do need a mechanism that somehow if a city's not approving the housing that the province can require it to be done. And so uh, engaging with the cities about how we do that is important so that it actually works and people are like, okay, I understand that. Uh, and I also think we need to address the concern that leads cities to not approve housing. Which, you know, we are we don't have a community center, mm. we don't have a swimming pool, we, we don't have School. the or, amenities, yeah. the schools, you know, these kinds of things. And and so uh, saying to them, look, you approve this housing, we're going to match that with the social infrastructure you need for a thriving community and, and hopefully overcome some of those objections. So this all sounds good. But when we look at BC, you know, we have record home starts in various different places across the province, including Vancouver, Victoria, and we have very low unemployment. So isn't there naturally just a cap on how much supply can even be built? Like, I think it's easy to say, oh, we'll just flood the market with supply but it's like, oh, you need people and capital to build this housing, right? Yeah, we do. And also, um, you know, in Vancouver, uh, there are thousands and thousands of rental housing units that are in a queue waiting to be approved still that are going to wait for years. Uh, in, my, in my community on 10th Avenue, there's a big empty site that used to be a Safeway. It's a contaminated site. Uh, the owner wants to build a big rental tower on it. Point Grey Village is is really struggling. Those renters would uh, be amazing for customers, for the businesses around there. Uh, and it's going to be years. They know it's going to be years, and uh, and it's so frustrating. So uh, there there are limits around uh, the people to build and the and that capacity. But uh, the the restrictions at the municipal level are pretty significant. But also, Mo, um, I think that uh, there's an opportunity here for the provincial government. And the provincial government doesn't usually build housing for middle class people. Mm-hmm. Like that's not the role for the government. Is always been building housing for the poorest of the poor. And I think we should be using public land and the government should be building uh, middle class housing, uh, attainable housing that people can own and uh, a rent to own or long term lease or co-op or these kinds of things. Uh, we can do it in partnership with First Nations as well. And we can also do it in partnership with the private sector. But uh, there's clearly a market failure, especially in centers outside of, uh, of Metro Vancouver. Uh, Prince Rupert, they're adding 800 jobs a year at the port and the housing's not there. So because the developers aren't there. So when uh, BC Liberal leader Kevin Falcon was on the show. He basically said that, yeah, this is the right approach. However, perhaps there was wasted time focusing too much on demand side measures and not enough time focused on supply side measures. So has your approach now shifted and why weren't why wasn't the province focusing on building more supply over the last five years? Yeah, I don't know quite why um, uh, Mr. Falcon ignores all the time that I spent calling for affordable housing to be built as the housing <laughs> critic for the NDP. I, he's got his own story about this, but uh, but international money in our housing market was a real issue. About 20% of the homes uh, in a few different communities in Richmond and Burnaby, uh, Vancouver was about 15% were being sold to international owners mm-hmm. until uh, the we compelled the BC Liberals to bring in the foreign buyer tax and we put the speculation and vacancy tax in place. Those are important things. The speculation and vacancy tax brought on thousands of new rental units that were previously empty. This is a really good thing to do. Mm-hmm. Now, I know he says he opposes uh, this blizzard of taxes, he calls them, that we brought in, but they're important. But so is the supply side. The, the, right. we, these two pieces are really important. And I believe that government uh, can play a role in providing that housing. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he's a pretty clearly a private sector guy. Um, and just leaving the whole thing to the private sector without government getting involved in, in building some of this housing we need, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to do it because that's what we've been trying. What would you say to his remark about you being the worst B.C. housing minister that B.C. has ever seen, especially when he was in government when, you know, Rich Coleman was 
the housing minister. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, we can look back to Little Mountain when uh, there was a low income community there. It was bulldozed and now it's just a, fa a flat vacant lot in Vancouver uh, and uh, and the housing that was supposed to be built didn't get built and, and all those kinds of things. But really what British Columbians care about is Will the government deliver on housing? Are there things that you can do? Is there more that you can do? And there is more that we can do. And so whatever Mr. Falcon's going to say, he's going to say all kinds of stuff. Uh, that's politics. But at the end of the day, for British Columbians, for me, if I'm the leader, for our caucus, is about are we building the homes that people need? Are we making progress on the issue? And that's what British Columbians will judge us on, not uh, whatever soundbite he's using. Absolutely. He's yeah. Well, hey, David, I have a few more questions before I let you go for the night. Okay. Okay. Folks, stick around after a quick commercial break. David Eby is going to be making an apology on my behalf. Up next, I'm Mo Amir. This is Van Culler. Welcome back to This is Van Color. My name is Mo Amir, and we've been chatting with the man who this year is poised to be the next Premier of British Columbia. He is David Eby. David, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thanks, Mo. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. So you wrote a guide about protecting protesters' rights, and this guide was actually handed out to protesters right before they ended up occupying your, consist your constituency office. When we, when we look at your activist past, is this something that you worry about, that maybe there are elements on the political left that go, well, David Eby's an establishment guy. He sold out. And then there's elements on the right going, this guy's an extremist. It, does that ever worry you as you as you look to become the premier of British Columbia? Um, you know, I think uh, a couple things about that, Mo. I, first of all, um, you know, I'm really proud of my work uh, defending rights and uh, educating people about their rights, letting them know uh, how the law works and, and in a bunch of different ways. Uh, I, I taught uh, law, I wrote about law, and, uh, and it was great. Um, and uh, people should know uh, that when they break the law, that there are consequences that flow from that. And that mm -hmm. is very clear in all of my books <laughs> uh, for both the left and the right. Because right now, um, I think there's an atmosphere around protest uh, where people feel like they need to be more and more extreme to make their point. Mm. On the right, uh, I had an anti-vaxxer break my constituency office window. Oh, wow. On the left, uh, we had people dumping uh, horse manure at the premier's office and mm -hmm. blocking traffic, gluing themselves to the road and that kind of thing. Uh, and, and I think that uh, we all just think, need to take a deep breath uh, and uh, learn to work together on political issues in different ways uh, because uh, the, the way that we're going is not great in terms of um, a political protest. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, if people are looking to me to be uh, ideologically left or ideologically right or ideologically center, for me, what has worked is trying to find solutions to the problems that are actually going to deliver for British Columbians. If it's partnering with the private sector to build affordable housing for British Columbians, like, let's do it. Mm -hmm. If it's uh, government going on our own to build the housing, OK, uh, uh, but let's get the housing done. Let's get the affordable housing there for BC families. And that's that's the important piece. So on the spectrum from sellout to anarchist, where do you land then? Yeah, I, know. I mean, that's right. People, uh, people are just so keen. They want to put you in this box. And, and that's what frustrates people about politicians, too, I mm -hmm. think, is that they refuse to look at solutions that might be outside of the ideological range that they're in. Uh, and we need to be more flexible about that. I think that's what people want. Now, the BC NDP have been accused of being the most secretive government in Canada. And people point to either changes in the FOI rules, freedom of information requests, or they, they point to maybe some COVID data that was released throughout the pandemic. What's your response to that charge? Well, um, I was in opposition uh, when the BC Liberals were in government and uh, uh, when um, there were investigations into deleting records and pages ripped out of reports and so on. So, you know, I think we're doing OK I, on, uh, on transparency as uh, minister responsible for housing, uh, for example, uh, when Ernst and Young did a report about um, about the situation of BC housing and our need to improve uh, capacity inside that organization. We released the whole report unredacted and uh, and when people want to look at my calendar, who I'm meeting with. Uh, they didn't uh, find that the names were deleted. They were they found <laughs> that uh, they could see everybody who I've met with. Sure. And those are proactively released. And so we proactively release a lot of records. And I, I just um, I mean, I'm, I, I do understand uh, that a number of people are concerned about the FOI changes, but the cost of implementing uh, so many FOIs across government and it, it wasn't just central government. It was all the school boards, all the health authorities and so on was was really uh, huge. So asking people for a small amount of money to file those 
those requests. Uh, helps uh, make sure that the requests that they're sending in are not just fishing expeditions. This is information people want, and people can still access their own information for free. Do you foresee the FOI system, the Freedom of Information system, changing at all in the next two years? Or are there any sort of updates or tweaks that you would like to add to that? Um, you know, uh, it's not uh, it's not number one on my priority list, Mo. I, I think um, when I think about the the issues related to government that I'm particularly interested in uh, that we haven't talked about, um, you know, it's it's more about issues related to housing, money laundering, uh, things that I've worked on for a while where I think we can make some progress in different ways than we have. Uh, and also uh, carrying on the work that we've committed to to fulfill the mandate, uh, the, the commitments we made to British Columbians. Now, I saw an interesting fundraising tactic that you recently employed where you were making apologies on yeah, behalf right. of donors. Yes. I'm not going to give you any money. However, you did say that you would make an apology on my behalf and you can look down the barrel of that camera to make that absolutely apology, Mo. Make it sincere. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I hope this helps you. <laughs> Mo. Katie. Hi, my name is David Eby and I'm a leadership candidate for the BC NDP. I just wanted to say I'm extremely sorry on behalf of Mo Amir that he ate the last ice cream sandwich without even giving you a bite while you're watching Law & Order Special Victims Unit. <laughs> that worked? What a way to end the season. Absolutely, man. David. Thanks for having Premier me. Premier EB, future Premier EB, thank you so much for this. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. A good <laughs> chance to wear a Hawaiian shirt. When you're Premier, you're coming back on the show, right? You bet. All right. We'll have to get a new theme. Folks, that was BC's outgoing Attorney General and very likely your next Premier of British Columbia. He is David EB. For more, be sure to check out This is Van Color wherever you listen to your podcasts as we're going to record some overtime with David EB to discuss the Cullen Commission, BC Housing, ICBC, and a whole lot more. But for now, that's our show for the night. And that's the first season of This Is Van Color right here on Check and the Check Plus app. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching. I hope you've had as much fun as I've had in our inaugural season. And I'm so grateful for every guest of this show for their valuable time, to the team at Check who has dedicated so much hard work and faith in me to bring the guests and discuss the issues that I want to cover. And again, to you, the viewer, thank you. This is truly a dream come true. And we're going to be back bigger, badder and bolder on a new night starting September 8th. Season two moves to Thursday nights at 9 p.m. in September, right after Steel and Vance, the newest Czech original program featuring Linda Steele and Jody Vance. Czech's Thursday night lineup this fall is going to be a banger. There is nothing on Canadian television like it, I promise you. But until then, this is Van Culler and I'm Mo Amir telling you that in a province where you can be anything, be colorful. Peace.